love this district, and I have loved my years on the school board. And, um, and I am very, very happy to do this introduction because, of course, I know Melissa very well, and, what, and she is such an incredible expert, and it is such a privilege to have her explain the complexities of this crazy system of education finance. Um, before I do that, I want to say that um, I have been attached one way or the other to the foundation for all the years I've been on the school board. And the foundation is just an incredible, often not fully appreciated, organization. And I think I have um, enough experience with lots of superintendents and lots of projects and lots of time and thousands of kids to know that the foundation is a critical, critical player in what's been done in this district. And when you think about programs that have gotten started over time, I could just stand here. I could take up a whole hour and tell you foundation stories of where all the superintendents who I have known have all come to points of critical juncture where they knew there was something instructional that they really wanted to do for kids and they couldn't quite pull it off because they didn't have the resources or the flexibility of their resources to turn them to something that was a new idea a good idea, something that should be started, and the foundation has always been a partner. So I just cannot say enough about this incredible organization, how much we all benefit from its existence. So with that, I will say, and now I'm going to tell you that not only are we going to introduce Melissa, who is a resource that we could not exist without, even in normal times, and this is not normal times, so we're even better off now than we are usually. And, um, and then say that um, Kaya Neff and I are the co-chairs of Bellevue Quality Schools, which is that nonprofit group uh, that comes together every four years in order to uh, run a campaign for levy and or bond election that is happening now. And um, Melissa is not campaigning. She's just informing. But Kaya and I are in the room, and we are campaigning. So if anybody wants to talk about the details and how important it is, We'll be happy to pick up that conversation later. And so for now, Melissa Padilla, our deputy superintendent. Thank you guys for coming. I know taking a piece out of the middle of your day is not always the easiest, so I appreciate you coming and thank you to the foundation for providing lunch. Um, that always gets people there. Oh, hold on, I have to uh, log in here real quick. All right, Mike's going to get this started for us. So, um, you know, the first thing I want to say is that this is not an easy topic, right? It's a pretty heavy topic. And so I've tried to simplify everything as best I could. But feel free to throw up your hands and ask questions if um, I confuse you, <laughs> which this is a confusing topic, so I wouldn't be surprised if I did that. Um, so today we're going to talk about how schools are currently funded in Washington and how that is changing um, based on what happened last summer. And then we're going to uh, talk a little bit about what is the impact to us as a school district as well as what is the impact to um, our community and our taxpayers. Um, even though the legislator had come to an agreement on how they were going to fund the theory, things are still in flex because there's been some unanticipated consequences of the bill of the legislature that they pass. So I believe come January they're going to revisit pieces of that. And then I even think as we move forward, this is not a done deal. And so I think things are going to continue to flex as we um, move forward. So at the end of this, um, oh, first, just, this is just my quick background, um, who I am, where I came from. We'll skip over that. Um, <laughs> um, at the end of this, uh, what, should, what you should know when you were done, okay, is these four questions. I hope that you can answer these four questions. All right? Um, is the state fully paying for education? Why do we need local levies? If we don't have them, what can we lose? And will your taxes go up if they pass in February? 
four basic questions. But in order to get to these questions, I'm going to take you through um, some slides and hopefully a little story. So our finances really fall on four, three different buckets. Okay, we have our general fund, which you can think of as your checkbook. And that's what we pay everybody out of, right? We pay salaries and benefits out of that. We pay materials, we pay utilities, we pay for paper, we pay for books. Um, this is gonna be posted on the website, on Bellevue School Foundation's website, on our website. And the only reason I'm saying that is so that you don't have to take pictures of the slides and stuff. They'll, they will be available for you, okay? Um, so basically, that is what we use for our everyday operations. We have two other places where we have money. One is in capital and technology. And the capital and technology, um, we utilize that for all of the technology that is in our school buildings, for the one-to-one -one computers that we have for our middle school and high school students. For those of you who don't have middle school and high school students, we give them computers to use during the school year and they take them home and use them in all their classrooms. Um, it pays for the 3D printers that are out there. It pays for some of the STEM work that we're doing. So that is also a local tax um, that you pay, and that is re renewed every five years. So that is one of the things that will be on the ballot in February, okay? We also have our bond or building fund, and that is what we are using to build all the new schools. So. Um, Sammamish is just being finished, Stevenson we're in the middle of, Tilton has another year, Highland Middle School is going to be started. So we've been on this program for about 20 years now and um, that is currently um, continuing and we will not be asking taxpayers for any additional um, bonds to build additional schools this February, okay? So we're going to really focus on the general fund because that is what we use to educate children on a daily basis. Yeah. Well, um, so the state funds about 164 million of the 300 million, okay? So, um, that would probably be about 25%, if you were to take, maybe a third. Okay. So, um, this is how that $300 million breaks down, in terms of where the revenue sources are. Okay, $65 million of it today comes from our local taxpayers. We are limited in terms of how much money we can collect from our local taxpayers. We collect approximately um, 21, almost 22%. That limit is set at 34.6%, to be exact, of what we got from the state and federal government the previous year. So even if you guys said, we want you to collect more money because we want this program or that or universal early learning, we are not allowed to collect more than that number, okay? And we're collecting the maximum we can collect. All right, so that right now is set at 65 million. We get 164 million from the state, and that is calculated based on something called the prototypical school model, where the state says, for a school of 400 students at the elementary level, here's how many teachers you should have, here's how many principals you should have, here's the number of custodians you should have, here's the number of tech support people you should have, and once they come up with how many you should have, then they multiply it by what they think their salary should be and what they think their benefits should be. And so they give us that amount of money, and then they say, and by the way, you should have this much in materials, supplies, and operating costs. They also give us some um, money that's called, I call it categorical funding, but it's for the demographics of our students. So how many English language learners do we have? How many special ed students do we have? What kind of transportation services do we have? So they give us some money for specific things on top of that prototypical school model. And then we have all this other money. And really, that's where um, the PTSA donations come in. That's where the foundation donations come in. 
That's where we get our federal funding. And our federal funding is only about $12 million. It's not very much, right? So you don't get much from the feds, but um, we do get $12 million from them. So by and large, the majority of our money comes from our local taxpayers and from the state, okay? Um, of this $300 million, about 85% is salaries and benefits. We are in a people business, okay? So that means about $250 million of that is salaries and benefits. So now the state, while they have this prototypical school model, I have to tell you they are not fully funding our educational model here in Bellevue. One of the things that they don't do is they don't really fund all the people that we need in our school buildings, or even to support our school buildings. So in 2015-16, they funded 808 teachers. Well, we have 933. So those 125 teachers, we pay for out of local levy. They fund 4.7 nurses for all 28 schools. <laughs> we have 15.6, which really isn't even enough, right? That's not even enough. Um, so they only fund 78 custodians, we have 93, and on the technology side, they fund 11 tech support people. Now remember, all of our middle schoolers and high schoolers have laptop computers. So with 11 people, we wouldn't be able to support them. So we've got um, 33, which even then is light. Okay, so they don't, um, so they really don't fund the number of people that we believe we really need in order to provide the educational model that we have here in Bellevue. But not only do they not fund enough resources, they don't fund them at the appropriate salary level. So currently, a brand new teacher, um, straight out of college that we may hire, the state funds at $35,000 a year in terms of their salary. We pay them $48,000 a year. So that $13,000 difference, we pay for out of levy. And that is true for many, many positions within that prototypical school model. The state just has not kept up with the market. And so we have to cover that difference with um, local funding, okay? So that is where the majority of our local funding goes to. In fact, it goes to more people, competitive market-based salaries, longer days for our, our teachers, and more days. So we have summer school, we have professional development for our teachers. And the more people we use for specific things, like the seven period day at secondary schools. So what that does is by having that seven period day, it requires 17% more teachers in those buildings. Okay, so the, the state pays for six, we have seven, and so we have to have more teachers in those buildings to cover those additional periods. Um, so really those more people pay out in terms of programs for kids and pay out in terms of opportunities for our students. So if you think about it, um, a high school with six periods, a student who takes their four core subjects and then say they're in band, right? And then they have to take two years of world languages in order to um, go to college. And then they have to take a certain number of years of PE and then they've got to take health. They really have no opportunity to explore anything else. They can't explore any coding courses. They can't explore any additional art courses. They can't explore anything. And so that's why we have the seven period is because it really allows our students to explore other things that they may be interested in, okay? The same thing at middle schools. It allows students to take world languages at middle schools. It allows students to explore CTE offerings at middle schools. That's why that seven period is really important to our community and our students. So this is what we pay, use our levy to pay. The one other thing I want to point out is special education is right up there at the top. The state does not fully fund special education, and neither do, does the federal government. 
So we find about $13 million of our local levy is used for special education. Okay? And that is not changing with what the decisions were that they made in July. So in June of last year, um, at the very last minute, the legislature um, came out with a new funding model for schools. And what they did is they basically, um, it's basically a property tax shift. You know, um, some people have referred to it as a levy swap in the past. They didn't use that name, but in essence, that's what they did. They um, basically increased your state property taxes and they lowered the maximum amount of money that we can collect in our local levies. So right now, remember I said our number is about 65 million, and that's that 34.6% of the previous year's funding. Well, they've changed that so that now we can only collect the lower of $1.50 per $1,000 of assessed valuation, or $2,500 per pupil, okay? So that means instead of the 65 million that we could collect locally, we can only collect 50 million. All right, so that's a drop. Um, when we get more money from the state rather than locally, that money does come with more restrictions on it. So our local funding is really flexible. We get to decide how we spend that. Our state money, not so much, okay? It comes with restrictions. For example, um, the 17 to 1 uh, class size for kindergarten through third grade, um, that is a compliance model. If we don't have that 17 to 1 ratio, then we don't get that money. And I want to caution you that that is a calculated figure. You will not walk into a classroom and see only 17 kids because included in that are um, PE teachers and music teachers and art teachers. So there's a lot of other um, certificated people in the school building that are included in that calculation. But if we don't hit that number with that calculation, then we don't get the funds for that. So it's purely compliance-based. Um, and the impact of this on every di district is gonna be different. So, as I said before, we're collecting all of our levy. It's about 34.6% of previous year's spendings. Well, Lake Washington is only collecting somewhere between 24 and 26%. And so when they get that reduction to $2,500 per student, it's just not as big a reduction, right? For us, it's a much larger reduction because we were collecting more to begin with. And so the impact on each district is going to be different. And so as you're watching the media or seeing things, just know that um, what you read about Seattle or what you read about Issaquah or what you read about Lake Washington is not going to be the same thing as what's going on in Bellevue. Okay? They're all going to be a little bit different. Um, for our community, our increase in state property taxes will be larger than our drop in local property taxes. So this is what that looks like. Now, we, um, our state tax burden is really calculated for the entire county. So it's calculated for King County. And there's this ratio called the indicated ratio that is calculated by the Washington Department of Revenue. And basically what it is, it's the relationship between the actual market value of your home and the assessed value of your home. And that varies based on the county that you are in. And so what they do is they use that ratio to adjust the tax rate so that we're all paying based upon the market value. Make sense? Doesn't really, but that's what they do. <laughs> right? It's like, well, can we confuse this anymore? So in King County, we currently pay $2.08 per 1,000 for our education levy, okay? That's the piece that is designated for K-12 schools. In 2018, next calendar year, because tax years are calendar years, they start in January and in December, you will be paying $3.04 per 1,000. That's an increase of 96 cents per 1,000. Now, they can go up to 
360, and actually, once we put that indicator factor in, it would, could go up even higher than that, but they're not going there right now. They're at this $3.04. In 2019, so there's a gap year there, right? 2018, taxes are going up from the state. 2019, our levy limit is dropping. And so right now we're collecting a dollar fifteen per one thousand. If we go to twenty five hundred dollars per student, our rate will drop to we anticipate eighty cents per one thousand. So you see increase of ninety six cents from the state, decrease of thirty five cents locally. Okay. All right. But they're a year apart. I just wanted to go back to the previous slide. Yeah. Uh, my question was about, so the state did this property tax shift. We know we're getting less levy dollars. Did the state send us more money, granted, and they not have sent us enough money to fund education as we know and like to tell you, but are they sending us more money? You're a great lead in, I'm getting there. Okay, okay so give me one sec. Sorry. A few more slides. <laughs> All right, here we go. Here you go, next slide even. <laughs> All right. Right now we're at that $302 million, right? So these numbers are based on the Office of um, the Superintendent of Public Education, OSPI, Public Instruction, I should say. Um, and you can look up on OSPI um, all of these figures and numbers, um, they put out um, forecasts in terms of what they think the districts will be getting, okay? And there's a lot of assumptions built into this, but um, so I used OSPI's forecast, and basically, so this year we're at 302 million, next year we anticipate being at 330 million, okay? Um, our levy portion, though, is dropping, so that will drop um, next year to 58 million. So you're probably going, why not 50 million? Because we budget on a mixed tax year, right? So we budget on 18, 19, and so we split what we collect. So that's kind of halfway between that 65 million and that 50 million. Okay, does that make sense to everybody? Yeah. Tax years versus our fiscal year. So we'll be at 58 million and then we'll drop to the 50 million. Um, there's some adjustments in there for student growth and some other things, but um, we, will get, we will definitely be getting more from the state. The problem is, is that that money, well, $28 million looks and sounds great. Um, that money is already being designated for specific things. So you remember I said that they were, we were underpaying staff. So the first thing is 10 million of that 28 million is that K3 class size compliance. So if we're not compliant with that, and by the way, we don't have enough classrooms to be compliant with that. Now we can look at different models in order to do that, but um, so if we're not compliant, we're not going to get that money. So that's the first piece. If we do get it, then it's going to go to the staff that we hire in order to be compliant. Okay, which you know is in the benefit of students. So there are cases where our priorities do align with the state. So I don't want to pretend like they don't. They absolutely do. But then there's also 12 million dollars that we anticipate getting in um, cost of living adjustments. So those are the raises that they give to staff, um, increasing the amount that they pay towards employee benefits. So right now, school district employees get less towards employee benefits than state employees do. And so they're upping that over time. Um, so they're gonna continue to up that. Um, and there's some other changes in there around employee benefits. And then they're increasing the amount the employer must contribute to employee retirement. And so that money basically comes in and goes out. Right, comes into us, goes out to cover employee benefits, goes out to cover employee retirement, and goes out to employees in terms of the cost of living increase. So basically that 12 million goes to 
the employees that we currently have that are funded by the state. But we have to pay that to all employees. I can't look at a teacher and say, oh, you are funded by the levy, therefore you don't get any of these things, but you're funded by the state, so you get them. Right? We have to apply it to everybody across the board. And so that's what that other two and a half million is. That's us putting the same things in place. And that comes, so that would come from our levy, but it's just additional costs that has to be covered, right? Which basically means that we have $3.5 million left out of that $28 million for programmatic changes. And um, that's kind of like budget dust. Kind of right. It just it's one percent of our budget, so it just floats out there, and um, you know it could be taken up here with extra staffing because we get more students or those types of things. In 1920, we kind of have the same types of things going on, and that leaves us with another 1.3 million. And so, well, it looks like we're getting this big windfill. Windfall? We're really not. And and again, I I want to stress that every district is different because Lake Washington because they were collecting less local levy, is getting more coming in. They're not seeing as big a differential as we are. Because our levy is dropping more than their levy is dropping. Does that make sense? The way that they structured this is really um, hitting many districts differently. So let me give you an example of Everett School District. So Everett School District is not a property rich district. They have about the same number of students that we have. And so if you look at the lower of $1.50 per $1,000 or $2,500 per student, they're at the $1.50 per $1,000. And so while we can collect about $50 million, they can only collect about $38 million. So that's a huge issue for them, right? Because they're getting hit with that $1.50 marker. And so that's one of the things that the ledge is going to be looking at, because those are some of the unintended consequences that are happening. Um, OK. So, so here are the changes. So basically, the state is shifting the burden of fully funding salaries from local levies to the state. That is the shift that they're making. Um, so they're going to increase that $35,000 number up to $40,000. They're adding a regionalization factor, which for us is 18%. So if you take that $40,000 and you add 18% onto it for a brand new teacher, you're at $47,500. So that's pretty close to our $48,000. So the state's shifting that burden to them. But they're not making any changes, they're ch making minimal changes, I should say, to the resources that they're funding. So they're not going to fund more teachers, they're not going to fund more behavioral specialists, they're not going to fund more counselors, they're not going to fund more nurses, okay, they're not changing those things. They are, uh, we are getting additional funding for specific expenses, as I said, so that's the cost of living allowance, that's those employee benefits, retirement contributions, and then the mandated program changes like the K-3 class sizes. Our non-state funded staff do need to receive those same um, increases. And so, for example, this year, when the state came out with their budget, um, because of those changes, we were immediately at a $4.2 million deficit without changing anything else because the state increased what they're paying employees, and we had to apply it to all our employees and their total salary, okay? Um, so that will still keep going on as we move forward, but it will become less of a burden because they will be covering more of the salaries. Um, and then what this does is really it's taking away our flexibility and some discretionary spending. And so basically in two years, we are going to lose about $13.5 million and flexible spending, okay? About $6 million each year. So, big question. Is the state fully funding K-12 education? No. The answer is sort of. <laughs> <laughs> they are 
are funding, they are funding um, their definition of basic education. They are not funding our community's expectations of K-12 education. And I've already showed you kind of this list in a different format, but um, the key, the one key thing that they're not funding that um, they absolutely should is they're not fully funding special education. And that is one of the other things that they are going to be looking at in January, is my understanding from talking to our local legislators. Yeah. So the question is, is there any real new money coming into the system? There is some new money coming into the system. It's not as large as really needed to come in in order to fully fund. And that new money is going right back out in, in the form of benefits, cost of living allowances, and those types of things. So there's no real new programmatic money coming into the system. Okay, they're, they're taking what we have Previously, they're taking a piece of what some districts have been collecting locally and then putting it into the state and redistributing it, okay? So where are we at in terms of our local property taxes and what do they pay for? So we basically, this coming February, we basically are gonna be running three levies. The first one is the education operations levy. So that's that $50 million levy that I talked about. That is a replacement for the 65 million that we are currently collecting. And that is what we use to fund the programs, the everyday programs in our schools, like the seven period days, um, the tutorial, security, um, band, orchestra, music in our elementary schools. Those are the things that we use to run those programs in our school buildings. We're also going to be running a capital and technology levy. That is what we use for two different things. One, we use it for our, all of our technology, so the one-to-one -one computer programs. For secondary, we use it for laptop cards. We use it um, to support STEM learning and our 3D printers and electronic curriculum and all those things. We also use it to maintain our facilities. Um, so our oldest new building is Phantom Lake and it's over 20 years old. Can you believe that? 20 years. And so it gets to the point though that we really do need to maintain those buildings and we need to do things like um, replace carpeting and those types of things. So that's the big project money. It's not money for painting or small maintenance items, but it's the big ticket maintenance items that we use that for as well. We also are going to be running a transportation vehicle levy. And we haven't run that in 15 to 20 years. It's been a long time. Um, this is money really to buy buses. So the state does pay for transportation and they pay for um, depreciation on buses, but we depreciate buses over 13 years. And in 13 years, the cost of a bus generally rises. And so they only cover the cost of what the bus cost originally as brand new, not the cost of what a bus would cost today. Nor do they pay for new vehicles for enrollment growth. And as we've been growing over the last number of years, we've had to add routes, buses have gotten more crowded. Um, we've held on to buses past their full depreciation. They're still safe, they still run fine. But um, we've held on to them because we were edging our bets a little bit against enrollment growth and other things. So um, we're also gonna run the transportation vehicle levy. We are not doing anything with respect to bonds or building new buildings or schools. So this is what we can, we're estimating for tax impacts. Right now, um, we're currently paying a total of $5 per 1,000. Um, it's made up of $2.08 at the school at the state school tax, and then $2.92 locally. Next year, that's gonna go up to $5.85. Your local burden will drop next year because we levy an amount, and so as the assessed valuation for the area goes up, the rates will drop. The actual dollar amount you're, changing, you're paying may or may not change, it depends on 
how much your particular piece of property went up in comparison to the total assessed value for the school district. However, new construction does pay their fair share. So when they come in, they're part of that denominator then and they'll, they'll pay um, that same rate. After the election, um, it will drop from the 585. The transportation vehicle levy is only a one-year levy, so that's, you see that 12 cents um, per 1,000 in that first year. So it'll drop, locally will drop from 281 to 274, assuming everything passes. It would then um, continue to drop down to 250 and then 243. So it would continue to drop from there for the local piece. The state piece um, continues to rise a little bit, and this is based on the Washington State Department of Revenue numbers. So I don't know, I really don't know why they're rising a little bit, ex except for the anticipated difference between um, market values and assessed values would be my assumption there. Okay, so based on this, there's three things I need you to remember. First, that for our general fund operating fund, that our local levy makes up 18% of our budget. That's a big percent. Even after we drop to $50 million, it's 18%. And so I want you to remember that because that does, if, if our levies don't pass, then we're going to have some real tough decisions to make. And we'll engage the community in making those decisions, but they will definitely be some tough decisions to make. Um, and losing our local taxes would eliminate many things that we in this community have come to love about the Bellevue School District. If the levies are approved, your taxes will not go up further than they are in 2018. Okay? They will, they are, we are looking at replacing things that are already in place. And the election will be in February. So, questions? Yes? I thought that was very bad in a higher level way. So, is that even though we are very bad in the year, we see that we have 25% of the state funding that we so we are grandfathered right now with a higher levy. The question is about the grandfathering of our levy rates. We are grandfathered in at a higher levy rate right now. That's that 34.6%. That grandfathering goes away under the new law. Yeah. Yeah. I thought OSBI had to approve your levy and you weren't allowed to fund things that were being Will that affect us? So um, that is not going into effect this fall. So you're absolutely right. Part of the new law has OSPI approving things that we're going to fund with our levy. Um, you know what? It was very broad what they put into the law. So if you read it, it says additional opportunities for students can be funded. And so that seventh period day is really additional op opportunities for students. And so um, it's pretty broad what they put in there. And um, so I don't see that impacting us for this next round of four-year levies. And then I really expect things to change over the, that same period of time as we move forward. Other questions? Yeah. Yeah, so there's a couple of things they're going to debate. I think they're going to debate the $2,500 per student or $1.50 per 1,000, that limit, because I think it had some adverse effects on some school districts. Um, I think they're going to be talking about special education and the funding of special education and what that's going to be looking like. I also think they're going to be talking about um, the compliance issue around the K-3 class sizes. Part of the issue there is they're not they're not going to be fully funding things for two years. They're rolling it in over two years. So to hold us that compliance basically says that we've got to put part of our levy dollars towards that because they're not fully funding it. And so I think those are kind of the three things that I know of that people are talking about them talking about. Yeah. When you, um, when you list the operating budget of the 300 million, um, yeah, yes, that, the next, yeah. When you list the 300 million as the operating budget, how many levies does that total amount include? How many local levies? Just one. Just the one. 
just the one, it's gonna, it, right now we've been calling it an education and operations levy. The name will be moving to an enrichment levy based on the laws that just passed. And then the second levy, which we've always had, the capital and tech levy, that falls into the other, the third category down there of others? No, it's not part of that fund. So okay. it's a totally separate set of money and you can only use that for very specific items. Okay. So there, it's not part of that at all. Yeah, so generally there are um, districts out east who um, have a hard time passing levies and so do not get a lot of levy dollars and so they're going to be getting more state dollars and not necessarily losing levy dollars the way that we are. Yeah. I keep thinking about, uh, you know, friends that have said, like, in Issaquah, they don't have money for, um, you know, art. they don't have art teachers in their elementary schools, they have to bring them in and think. I guess I'm thinking along the lines of, uh, we're pretty special here in Bellevue that we do have the seven period day, because most of the other kids I know, even in Was uh, Lake Washington and North Shore, only have a six period day. Right. right. And, like, the art and the... Um, and the music and stuff that we all think we all know is important, they don't mm -hmm. get in even other districts around here. So I just wanted to kind of note that it's a huge deal that Bellevue um, is working to make sure we keep these things because they aren't funded by the by the state, and not even other districts right around us have been funding. Them. So I don't know. I just I didn't realize how much other places didn't have until recently. And so thanks for all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, they are huge for all our kids. Yeah. Um, well, this, if we have students currently in um, elementary and middle school uh, as well, will they um, feel any impact over the next couple of years? Will they personally feel any impact of what the legislation did? Um, not if we pass our levies. My biggest concern is the, the legislature um, has increased our local tax burdens significantly. I don't want to understate what they've done because it's significant. And in fact, all of our local legislators voted against this. And the reason, they didn't vote against it because of K-12 funding. They voted against it because of the revenue source. Because we have people in our district who are on fixed incomes. This is a huge hit to them. And this is a huge hit to property owners in this district. And so they wanted to use a less regressive form of funding K-12 education. And so all of our legislators voted against this from that perspective. Um, so I'm concerned about taxpayer fatigue. I think it's a real thing. I think this is going to hit people's pocketbooks next year, in 2018, and I'm concerned. I'm concerned about that because I, I think um, it's really a burden on communities like ours to get the 96 cents per 1,000 hit, especially if you're a fixed income, been in your home for many years, bought your home back in 1975 or whatever, and you know, you've been in that house for 40 years and look at the value then versus the value now and you're retired and all of a sudden your property taxes take this big of a jump. It's huge. So I worry about that. Yeah, Francine. So you showed the $302 million, the $330 million. You talked about how the new money coming from the state is more limited in how we can spend it. You talked about a little bit about cost of living increases. I still don't have a sense though, is say the 2018, 2019, is that enough given all of the increases in you know cost of living, all of that, or are we still short because um, of the lower level? We we're gonna have to make some decisions in 2018, 19, and 19 and 20, 2019, 20, and 2021. 
depending upon what inflation does and how much. So our levy dollars, levy limit amount, is supposed to move with inflation. But as we know, it depends on what's going up and how much, right? So we should be moving with inflation. This does take away our flexible spending, and so we want to introduce new programs. We're going to have to make adjustments, and we're going to have to do what we all do every day in terms of what are our priorities for our spending. Right? Yeah. No, I assume flat. No, I assume flat. So our levy limit would also go up as students grow, and so would our state. So, and it, you know, our student growth um, has been relatively high recently. This year it's flattened out a little bit, and I, I have a feeling that the cost of homes in our area is driving that down a little bit. Because it's hard to, number one, find a home, number two, afford a home, right? Yeah. You said that the government funds part of the transportation costs, so the buses and things like that. But then, on the other, further down, you also said that they aren't funding our buses. So right. What are they funding? So, so they, they fund our drivers. Students, but we're not getting any buses to compensate for that growth of students. No. So they don't fund the vehicles themselves. Okay. They fund gas. They fund drivers. Operational. And they pay, and they cover the cost of depreciation on vehicles. But if you bought a car 13 years ago and you depreciated over 13 years, what you're going to buy today is going to be a lot more than what you paid 13 years ago for a car, right? So we're in that same boat. So the money that they take for a bus driver, maybe we have to actually provide the bus for the bus driver. Yes. Yes, this is assuming um, our levy passes in February. Yeah. So if I understand correctly, you said we will have about 3.5 million left over for the distribution spending, uh, despite all the extra they're giving. And you also said that in two years we lose about 13.5 million. In discretionary spending dollars. So that leaves us with a gap of 10 million? No, no, no. That, it's a, no, so um, we lose we lose the ability to determine how that money is spent. But there, so right now we are covering a lot of teachers' salaries. So the state's giving us more money to cover teachers' salaries. But historically, that was our choice. It's no longer going to be our choice. Does that make sense? So it's it's the discretionary dollars. They're replacing dollars. But there's more restrictions on them, and they're no longer our choice. So I, I guess what I'm trying to get a sense from, from a really lay person's perspective, and I'm preparing in the district, is I'm trying to get a, a sense on the order of a magnitude of the money that we might end up losing in flexible spending. So that, you know, let's say as an ambassador to the foundation, then I go to the community and I try to educate to them why they should give to the foundation. It is the scale of the money that you have to Yeah. So yeah. So the so look, the foundation PTSA donations are huge for us. The foundation donations allow us to pilot and look at innovative ideas um, and see how they work. And then, for example, the STEM education at elementary school, integrating STEM into the elementary curriculum. That was a pilot that the foundation paid for. The district has since taken that and blown that out into all of our elementary schools. And so the money we get from the foundation is huge because it allows us to explore innovative ideas that ultimately are great for our kids across all um, schools. PTSA donations are huge for individual buildings because the buildings then can do things for their specific needs in those buildings. So those monies are still very, very important. The fact is, is that the money that we get from the state is often restricted in terms of what we can use it for. Um, but the additional money we're getting from the state will replace some things that we're paying levy for right now. 
So sometimes our priorities and the state priorities align. They don't always align, but sometimes they do. Yeah. Um, I saw the slide that what we found locally. I didn't see any students. You took the special education. Right. So ELL, ELL right now is. Yeah, ELL students are funded by state right now. So it's like a, the last, you know, five, ten years. Yeah, they've been fully covered now. I mean, like, increase of ELL, but it's all covered by state. Yeah, the state has been increasing their funding of ELL students. In fact, they just increased it for this 17-18 school year as well. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah. Yeah, but you're comparing it to 16, 17, and so, so that, that I mean, so we're we're saying 53 million dollars more than the 300, but you're not comparing it. Yeah. Right. It doesn't matter. The increases in our assessed valuations compared to other districts will not impact um, our benefiting or not benefiting. Um, what impacts that is Lake Washington, because they were collecting less in local levies, they're not going to see as big a loss in their local levy. And so their, their increase from the state is going to be greater than their loss. That makes sense what I'm saying? Yeah, and they're going to pay the same 96 cents increase. They're going to be paying that exact same increase in Lake Washington School District. Everybody in King County is going to be paying that. Everybody in King County. So, other, yeah. So Melissa, is it fair to say that because the money that we're going to be getting from the state will have more restrictions, that it puts even more importance and in some ways pressure on the foundation dollars because that is flexible spending that the foundation works with the school district on, right? Yeah. And so that money becomes even more important because we have less ability to use the state money for pilot ideas, things to explore, and we will look now even more to the foundation to help as we find neat ideas that we'd like to fund. Is that true? That's very true. Did everybody hear what Hyam was saying back there? She said basically, with the greater restrictions on state dollars and the lower levy funds, does that put more pressure on dollars like the foundation dollars that we still get to be flexible about how we spend? And that's definitely true. Well, you guys, thank you so much for coming. Um, I want to echo her thanks, but I also really want to thank you, Melissa. You do a great job on this the school district. is very lucky to have you. I also want to let you know that when we send out the survey on this, we will also be sending some other information, such as the contact information for your legislators. I hope you realize uh, they're a key, uh, play a key role in this. And um, also where the slides will be located. And um, PTAs are encouraged to, you know, cut out slides and, and share them at their meetings um, and with their constituents. So, thank you very much. You know, Ian and I are very happy to come to any of your PTSA meetings. I mean, because one-on-one -on -one conversations, you know, questions pop up, and we really just like to talk to everybody. And the, the importance of parent reporting is going to be critical. It, it may be the ultimate, you know, game changer is whether or not parents will they don't always do that. And so we're really going to need you to, to um, get in that space for us.